Good morning. Scripture reading this morning will be from the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Thank you, Phil. I tried to find the passage that said, Thou shalt have sex, and I couldn't find it. So this is the closest I could come. There are some exciting things happening this week. Joshua already told you about them. The survey, we really want you to give us some feedback, uh, and it's designed for the people who are in here. Uh, if you're in the Spanish, which obviously you're not, it won't do us any good for you to fill out the survey about the Spanish or about what you think about someplace else. We just really want to know how you're doing here, what it is we're doing, is anything connecting, and uh, we'll, we'll see what uh, goes on from there. We've included a few other things that might give us some information about what to do. And then financial peace, I wish I'd known about that. When I was much younger, I would be a millionaire now. Okay, I would at least have enough to pay my bills now. <laughs> that will do more for someone than any other class about finances. It is incredible. So if you can take that, if you haven't taken that already, uh, it is absolutely worth the time. Okay, so we want to talk about one of the hardest ones, most difficult ones, but we've already sent all the little kids out, so uh, hopefully this will be a, a little bit easier as we talk about things. The first thing you need to know is God does want sex. I mean, he made it. He's the one who invented it. He's the one who created it. He's the one who made us able to do that. It's not an accident. It's not something to be avoided. And yet, at least when I was growing up, it's one of the things that we said, no, 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 don't, 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 don't. And then all of a sudden on one day, okay, go ahead. And, and it was confusing. It was hard. It was like, well, wait a second. I know a lot of people who have guilty consciences heard the no, 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 don't, don't, don't. And then when they said, go ahead, it was like, I don't know how to do that. Wait a second, I've grown up my whole life thinking this is sinful. Sex is not sinful. God never said that. God never intended that. When you use it the wrong way, with the wrong purpose, in the wrong place and time, anything good can become sinful, including sex. And so that's just where we are with all of this. I don't want you to think I'm against it, even though we don't have a command, thou shalt yeah. This is in the Sermon on the Mount, the passage that we are starting with. Jesus is talking about their law, the Ten Commandments. This is commandment number seven, in case you are wondering, and it is a negative commandment. As you look at the passage where Jesus is trying to explain, he first gives them the command, and then he says, I want you to understand what this is all about because it had been misunderstood and misapplied and they were not doing it. The commandment is very simple. You must not commit adultery. That's all it says. Now there's a whole lot more in the Bible about that and about how this happens and about what goes on. And so when it talks about committing adultery, you must not commit adultery means several things. First of all, it means that you're married. 
because that's the way adultery happens is between married people. And so that's what it really means. There's a lot more about what that means and about how that works. It also means we promised ourselves to one person. We took the oath, a vow that said, I pledge my life to you until death do us part. Sex is to be an expression of intimacy and love. That's what it's for. That's what it's about. That's why it fits inside of marriage, because it's safer inside of marriage. People have already promised to love each other until death do us part. And so therefore, it fits very well inside of that. And God intended for it to be this fragile thing that you're able to use, that you're able to share, that you're able to do, and you share it with one person. Now, that's the way God intended it. As you look at the world around us, that does not seem to be the way that we've taken it. And so understanding what it is that God intended with this may be a little bit different. Sex was not only permissible, it was expected. And if you get married, there's going to be some expectation there. I hope you knew that going in. If you look at 1 Corinthians 7, he says, I don't want you to not have sex. Well, to me, that's about as good as saying, yes, go ahead. He says, don't ever say, I don't want to. He says, that's not in the place. That's not what it's about. I want you to do that. And so he says, there's no reason why you would say, oh, well, God tells me it's wrong. No, God doesn't tell you that. Or that there's a reason why we would not. He says, there isn't any except if you want to dedicate yourself to prayer and then do it for a short time and, and then enjoy each other. And so that's what he's really trying to get at is saying that, yes, it's absolutely permissible. And God created it to be shared between two people. It holds them together. It is emotional. It's where they're able to give love and able to give pleasure and able to have important things happen in this relationship. It is an emotional bond. It should be an emotional bond. Um, and it always feels good, right? That may be a little bit problematic for us because God made it where it always feels good. And in fact... That's what a lot of people do. They say, well, it just feels right. Well, of course it feels right. God made it to feel right. But he made it to feel right in the right context. Wouldn't it be worse if he made it where, if you're in the wrong context, okay, it's going to feel horrible. No, he didn't do that. Where it's going to be horrible with everybody else except the absolute right person. No, he didn't do that. So when people come back and say, well, this just feels right, it's because God made it to feel right and because you don't have to worry about it ever feeling not right, but you do have to be responsible to be in the right place with the right person at the right time, and God's not the one who put that on. God's not the one who decided, I'm going to adjust the way it feels didn't do that, gave us the responsibility of saying, I want you to use it correctly. And so that's one of the things that we have to be aware of. Don't let anyone say, well, this just feels right. That's not an excuse. That's something that God was able to do. It is also powerful. It's one of the things that we share that can break everything else. So be careful with it. It can damage everyone in the relationship. Every single person. It destroys relationships in Scripture. If it's not used correctly. It's the only thing given in Scripture that Jesus says breaks marriage. It is the only thing. I would think there would be something like violence. If your husband beats you half to death... It does not say that. If your husband neglects you, if there are bad finances. Did I tell you about financial peace, by the way? Okay, you can solve that one. 
if there's hateful behavior, if he's unjust, if he's unfair, if he's just a terrible, awful person, none of those are given as a reason that it could break marriage. There's only one thing, and that is sex with the wrong person in the wrong time in the wrong place. That's the one thing. I want you to realize how powerful this is. It is the one thing. Now, I'm not sure I would recommend you staying in a violent situation either. But this is the one thing that Jesus says. So I don't think we always understand how important it is or how powerful it is or what happens when we misuse it. Because when we misuse it, it breaks things. And I want you to be aware of that. It's not about the mechanics. We're not going to go over that. It's built on promises. It's built on trust. It's built for a lifetime. And he simply says, don't commit adultery. That's what he says. So what about sex when we're not married? In fact, I think that's what a lot of people are going to. It, what about sex when I'm not married? How do I do that? How does that work? So then I can do anything I want, right? No. I mean, true, other people may not be involved, but yes, there are other people involved because it is meant to be that way. It is meant to be shared by two people who are in a loving relationship with a promise for a lifetime. And if you take it and you use it outside of marriage, it makes a huge difference. Sex is specifically created for that promise with people who have taken that vow. And some don't get married, I think, today specifically saying, well, I'm not going to break that. Well, as you look at what Jesus is talking about, though, it really isn't about that. He was really saying, I want you to be married. I want you to have sex in the right place inside of marriage. And that's the place where it fits. It doesn't mean it's okay if you're single to do anything you want or to have sex with anybody that you want. Because that's not the right place where it fits either. It doesn't mean sex is okay with God if it's outside of marriage. No, it means there's only one place and that's inside of marriage. And yet today, when I look around at what happens in our society, and especially at the news, you know what? That's almost normal. And especially when I talk to people who come and we get into conversations like that, they think it's normal. And it is not what God wanted at all. Just so you understand, there was a couple, not here, many, many years ago, that asked me to do their wedding. And so I said, okay, this will be great. She had grown up in the church, grown up in the youth group, and was one of those people that was just always on fire for the Lord, always doing great things. She waited a long time, and this really handsome guy came. He was big. He was cute. Her words, not mine. He was... <laughs> Everything she had ever wanted. He had just become a Christian. He was just gorgeous. Everybody, you know, thought, wow, this guy is really great. He was friendly. He was outgoing. Everybody wanted to be around him. Except for he had been in the world. Now, he had been a lot in the world. In fact, he had had multiple, multiple, multiple partners. He had been single all this time and had lots of experience. But now they were getting married, and so he was dedicated to her. This is where I want to spend my life. This is where I'm going to be. We went through the wedding, had a great wedding. Everybody was happy. This is going to be so good. Everything's perfect. When they got back from the honeymoon, they came to see me and said, uh, we need to talk. I was like, okay. And she starts off by saying, we haven't done anything yet. Well, I'm a little shocked. Okay, I mean, yes, it's okay. You can do that now. No, we haven't done anything yet. And he's looking everywhere around the room, you know. Not going to focus, not going to make eye contact or anything. And so we start, start trying to discuss about this, what happened, what's going on, and... He says, I can't. 
I'm like, what? I said, but you have all of this history. He says, exactly. And she is the perfect person. She has saved herself her whole life for this, and I can't. I'm like, wait, yes, you can. He said, no, you don't understand. You see, something was broken, and he could not unengage his past and all of those meaningless encounters to love the one woman that he really wanted to love. So I want you to know today, sex breaks. Sometimes when you misuse it enough, it is like anything else. You can destroy it. Their marriage didn't last. As I imagine you would know. I mean, that's one of the things that holds us together in those times when you fought and argued and disagreed and done everything wrong and everything bad. You know what? This kind of helps all the rest of that, doesn't it? But if there's no sex, it's pretty hard to be able to get along and pretty hard when somebody's got that much past experience and he cannot get past it. So I want you to know about that. And whether that happens with everybody or not, I'm not trying to say this is a scientific study at all. This is just a preacher in a little town and yeah, it happens because it makes a difference in what you do. Going back to the passage in Matthew 5, 27, he talks here about lustful intent. And so he says, don't commit adultery. And then Jesus comes back with, I don't even want you to have lustful intent. Okay, this is one that gets all of us in trouble, right? Because how do we work this? How does, what is this really trying to say? Because lustful intent applies whether you're married or whether you're not married. It doesn't really matter. You, there can be a lot of lust that goes on. You can have this longing desire, the point where you would if you could. So what's the difference in lust and a look? Because it's everywhere. It's how long you look, what you were thinking when you were looking, how far you went out of your way to look what you would do about the look. It can't just be that you saw something. The world we live in, it's, it's crazy. Especially because Arizona's warm, okay? In Alaska, it was no problem. Everybody had on parkas. It was no problem whatsoever at all. We were against mixed bathing back then. Fine, I don't want to swim in an icy creek anyway. There's no problem with that. But everybody doesn't live there. And after living in Miami for a while, boy, you see way too much, don't you? I mean, a lot more than you ever wanted to see. There has to be a way for us to still be human and for us to not have this lustful intent. And so it has to be that when you're close to your wife, she's the one you want. And you don't need to go anywhere else. You don't need to be with anybody else. And today there are a lot of distractions, a lot of different things around us, a lot of advertising. We hear the phrase sex sells, at least they try it that way. We have a society that is focused on that. It is so much a part of where we are, it's an obsession. We now make pills so that it's all possible. And that seems to be worse. And I wonder if that isn't part of the symptom. And it is actually seen as normal outside of marriage. Pornography is rampant. I mean, it's everywhere. If you've got a smartphone, it's right there. If your kid has a smartphone, it's right there. Pay attention. They don't need to be seeing that stuff. Is pornography adultery? I'm going to give you my opinion. No. Because it can get a whole lot worse. 
But Jesus says it is the intent. It is adultery in your heart. And just so you know, the reasoning then from people I've talked to goes like this. Well, if I've already done it in my heart, why don't I go ahead and do it? Because after all, then I'm like, no, not the same thing. Those are not equals, and they do not mean the same thing. So if it's in your heart, stop it in your heart. It gets much worse once it gets outside of that. This is what Jesus classifies as being against God. He says, he has no relationship you, with you in this. And then he gives you this warning. Isn't that weird? It's as serious as hell. And for the first time that I know of, Jesus recommends mutilation. That's not what he means. I don't think he means gouge out your eyes or cut off your hands but he is trying to tell you how serious this is, that there's got to be a way to do it. And there's got to be a way for you to realize that it is going to take some extreme behavior. And so his idea of cutting things off is you got to cut off wherever this source comes from. Your eyes are what you see, cut off whatever that seeing comes from. If that seeing comes from movies, if that seeing comes on your computer, if that seeing comes from the neighbor next door, if that seeing comes from a friend, no. Well, but they're my friend. Cut it off. That's what he's trying to say here is cut off whatever is the source of that. Your hands are what you do. And so cut off anything that you would be doing, cut off wherever you would be seeing, cut off anything that you would be hearing that leads you to this. And so he says that's where it's all got to come down to. We've got to be able to fight it at that level where it starts with what we want. Don't let yourself get into the want because you know and I know you're going to finish it. And that's just the way we are. You've got to cut it off at the beginning because that's exactly how it works. It may seem like it's gouging out an eye. It's going to feel that way. It's going to hurt that much for you not to look at things that cause lust because it feels so right, doesn't it? Cut it off if it's not what God wanted. Don't let other things cause lust. Don't even let yourself start thinking about it. That's where it's got to come. If a friend influences you, cut off the friendship. You don't need to be in there. Get yourself to a neutral place. A place where God's actually be able to be in there. A place that doesn't cause any of those thoughts. Control is at the obsession and the thought level, not at the behavior level. And this is where so many times we mess up. We think, oh, well, I'm thinking, but I haven't done anything. And it's not that bad of thinking. We're still looking. I mean, don't let yourself go there. And that's what he's trying to say is don't let yourself go there. And so this is one of the things I think Jesus is saying, you know, you've got to be able to cut off parts of your life when you let things go too far, when you let it go to a place you couldn't control and it's not about you having the control. It's about not letting that be part of your life. Boy, that's going to be hard in our day and time. Because every website, every car sales, I mean, you can't walk into the truck place because every truck's got a beautiful girl in the poster next to it, right? You can't sell a truck without a beautiful girl. What are you thinking? Everybody's got to have that. She does not come with the truck. I'm sure they would sell more trucks if that were the case, but she does not come with the truck. But it's used to sell. It's used to attract attention. It's used to do all kinds of things. We've got to be aware of this, and we've got to be able to help deal with all these things. Let me give you a couple of other passages. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 3. He says, but sexual immorality or all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you 
as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, who has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. He is saying it very, very plain. You do not go to heaven if you do not have control of this. It is just that simple. But I've got everything else. I understand, but this should not be part of any Christian life. Not even crude jokes. And yet, that's why we're here, isn't it? Because sometimes we struggle with things. And those who are as sexually immoral, he says, have no place in the kingdom of God. And those who struggle and who apply for forgiveness and try and find the grace of God have every place in the kingdom of God. God is coming in wrath if we ignore this. Don't be partners with him. Don't be involved in it. We don't belong with immorality. I have had another couple at one point, and I was called in to talk with them. They were married, and things were just not right. And it was the same type of thing. It's just, oh, I, you know, things are not going well, and you go through all these things. Well, what's not going well? And there's a whole bunch of stuff that they tell you. Nobody's ever honest in counseling sessions. Did you know that? I mean, they tell you all kinds of stuff in the world, which has nothing to do with the real problem. And then when you find out where the real problem is, you spent weeks and all, all kinds of hours trying to get down to what they should have said in the first place. But it really essentially comes down to this, because you don't know them. They're not here long, long, long ago. Everything like that. So they cannot seem to get on the same page. And once again, the problem is sex. And so the problem is that you know, she can't, she doesn't want to, it just nothing, you know, can't be involved in it whatsoever at all. And so I have to talk to her by herself, finally. This is a girl who grew up in the church. I said, so what's going on? And she's like, you know what? You know who my boyfriend was before. Yeah. She said, we had sex so many times that we just got tired of it which just blew me away. I'm like, is that even possible? <laughs> but that's what she said. And they broke up. And that was why they broke up. Is because of all the sex before they ever got married. I mean, they went together forever. And apparently had no qualms about having sex. And so when they decided that, well, you know what, I just don't even like you. That's all we were doing is getting together for sex. And that, that just really isn't even fun anymore. And so when she got married, she's like, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good. I try to be involved in it. I just don't like it anymore. For somebody to get to that level of saying, I just don't like it, what in the world did you have to do to get there? I want you to know it's possible. And I want you to think about what that means. When you become the person with all the experience, should anybody marry you? When you meet the girl of your dreams with all the experience, the guy of your dreams with all the experience, that may not be such a good thing. In fact, the more I talk to people, the more problems it is. You don't escape. 
You may even be forgiven of it. Jesus has washed it away, and you are no longer guilty, but it broke. And you cannot get it out of your head, and you still carry it with you. It would be simple to, similar to any other addict. Yeah, can't touch the stuff. Doesn't matter whether it's drugs or whether it's alcohol. Can't be around it. Can't. I'll, I'll completely lose it. With this one, it is so much oversaturation that they simply cannot function in that capacity. That's not where you want to go when you get married. That's a reason for saying, no, I'm not going to. I'm going to stay away from that because I don't want to be in that situation for the rest of my life. Had a great time in my 20s. And now for the rest of my life, I can't make it work. Be careful with somebody with too much experience. Romans chapter 1, verse 24, this is another side. I do not have time to cover all this subject, okay? Just so you know, there is so much in here that, that I'm leaving out that I don't have time for it. But just, this is the beginning part. In Romans... He says, therefore, God gave them up. He's been talking about this relationship and about how God made everything. We should understand everything. We should believe in God. However, some people have left and gone away. And so, therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their heart, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to the dishonorable passions for their women exchange natural relations for those who are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for each other, for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. This has become more and more. You see it everywhere. Homosexuality is rampant. It's on every TV show. You cannot have a sitcom without at least a gay couple in there somewhere. It's our society. It's where we live. And God says, I gave them up. Does that mean God doesn't care? Not at all. It means he's not going to do anything with them now. They exchange the truth of God for a lie. They worship the Creator. They have dishonorable passions. He describes homosexuality perfectly here. It doesn't matter sex with who the same rules apply. Just because it's homosexual doesn't mean it doesn't apply. It's the same thing. It's meant to be inside of marriage in a life commitment forever. That's not going to solve the homosexuality problem because now we have legalized marriage for them. Not exactly the way God would want it. It's no sex outside of a marriage to a woman. That's how I read the Bible. It says they gave up natural relations. It isn't that God doesn't care. Judgment is coming and he will save judgment for later and this would apply men or women okay there's something wrong with okay I'm just going to leave it I was going to say it and I'm not going to say it people are distorting what God made but in our society today it's almost a rite of passage you know what the worst slur you can throw at anybody the worst thing you can possibly say to a teenager is they're a virgin. There is more insult with that than almost anything else. And so we got to get past it. We got to get rid of it. We at least got to, you know, do it once so we can say, no, I'm not. Man, what happened if you were able to say, yes, I am? We take what's precious and we treat it as cheap, as if it's just something that you do. As if it's part of growing up. You know, you got to try all those things once. One drink, one cigarette, one everything. It's fun. It's nothing more. 
and we've lost morality along with the world around us. We even see it as a need for us physically. I cannot function without it. I am naturally this way and supposed to have this. We see sex as a right that we are entitled to. Nothing ever said it's a right or an entitlement. Nothing ever says it's a need. And so today there's the living together and there's a moving in together so that, you know, it's much cheaper and it's also much easier if we want to have sex. It's not practice for marriage. It's not trying to see if we're compatible or not. Sometimes that gets brought up. Well, we'll just see if we're compatible. Everybody's on their best behavior there. It's like an extended date. You know, you don't know what you're going to get till the dirty socks are there and everything else. But it's not practice. It does not fit that way. It doesn't solve the divorce rate. It doesn't solve the breakup rate. Because if that were the case by now, there ought to be 100% of marriages that function well all the time. Why is the divorce rate the same if we got all this practice? I mean, we found the right person, right? It doesn't matter which person you found, you can make them the right or make them the wrong just by what goes on. Because you don't keep the same person you started with. That's just what happens. We all grow, we all change, we all develop. The move out rate is much higher when you're just living together and it does not solve the problem. So why should we practice morality when everyone else is not? Because it's what God wants. It straightens out your life. It solves so many issues, not only in your life, but in all the people around you, because it gets so complicated with everybody else around you. And if God gives up on people like this, what is it we're supposed to do? Well, first of all, says God wants us to do it right. Secondly, he wants to teach our children to do it right. Let them know what God intended. Be the example. Keep the covenant. Be the one that, with the one that you promised to. Keep it because you promised. Not because they still look exactly the same as the day you married them. But because you promised and you keep your promises, right? You always keep your promises and we promised only death would break that and we keep promises. So God made sex for a purpose. He does want that. He designed it so that we can use it for relationships, for intimacy with the right chosen person. And basically, we all want to be loved. And sometimes when we decide we're not, we try it that way. But the loneliness of being rejected by someone you just had sex with is so much worse. It isn't love. It didn't feel anything. It might have felt good for a minute, but it's not going to last a lifetime. And even though it was bodies that were promising more, you know what? If there was no intent there, if there was no marriage there, if there was nothing else there, it just isn't going to happen. And your loneliness is worse than ever. Well, we could go on for a long time, and we don't need to do that. One last passage in Hebrews chapter 13, the positive one. It's hard to find the positive one. It says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So let marriage be held in honor. It needs to be a place. It needs to be realized. There are some special privileges there that are nowhere else. If you try them anywhere else, you will not find the same thing. It will be broken. It will not be the same thing at all. And we can look at what happens in the world. 
And we say, I refuse to live like that. I want to live like God. I'm going to refuse to be part of them. I'm going to honor marriage and honor what God intended. And God says, and I'll be with you. It isn't that God's trying to take away sex. He's trying to say, let's do it right. And so his forbidding adultery is just trying to say, let's do it right. That's what makes all the difference. And I don't know where you are today. As rampant as it is in our world today, I'm going to say there's a whole lot of us sitting here squirming, hoping nobody else in the audience really knows what's going on with us. And the good part about it is God has this amazing grace. Well, when we repent of our sin, he is able to forgive. And we start over. Can you get it back? I think so. I believe that you can. It might be like cutting off a hand, but you can get it back. And God forgives and takes away any guilt from it, and you are able to live a right life, and with that right life, you are able to get back to where God has what you wanted in the first place. And this is part of it. Put sex in the right place. That's the bottom line. You need this relationship with him because he's a God of love. And he's the one that fills you with this love. I expect no one's coming forward today because it would look bad. <laughs> so take this lesson with you. However, if you do want us to pray with you, I would invite you to 